praise be Jesus and Mary. I'm David Rodriguez, content director of the Fatima Center, welcoming you to our pilot show for a new series, The Signs and Secrets of Fatima, with our guest host, Mariana Bartold. Mariana, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, David. So as we mentioned, today is our first show, and uh, we'll let you know just a little bit about what this show is going to be about, dear viewer. Uh, but first, let's go ahead and just begin with a prayer, as with all things, and we'll, we'll just pray the Hail Mary, if you'll join us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. So again, I'd just like to very quickly and briefly introduce Mariana Bartold to you. Some of you may be familiar with her. She is rather prolific in terms of writing on the message of Fatima in various forums and websites and articles, magazines. Uh, so she actually has a couple of books, one of them called The Signs and the Secrets uh, of Fatima, which we'll be discussing a little bit more in this show, uh, but also, uh, for example, in Our Lady of Guadalupe. We have featured her on the Fatima Crusader, some of her articles. She hosts a podcast, Genesis 315. She's also one of the founding publishers of the Catholic Family's Magnificat and an editor of the magazine Sorsum Corda, which now goes by the name The Latin Mass Magazine. So many of you people might be familiar with that subscription. Uh, she has, of course, she's also digitally published some traditional classics on Kindle and does a fair amount of things also with, uh, with homeschooling and, and pages for that. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I think her page is Keeping It Catholic is what your yeah. uh, Facebook page is called. Is that all correct, Mariana? Anything I may have missed yeah. there? Uh, no, I think you covered it all. I just wanted to make a slight correction. Um, the Fatima book is called Fatima. The Science and Secrets. Um, that one is available as Kindle and paperback on Amazon. Guadalupe is Kindle only, but we are looking into doing an updated version of it and making it available as a paperback. Fantastic. That's Thank it. you. So uh, I'd like to just jump right in and by just sort of at first mentioning the purpose of this, I think, and that's that the message of Fatima is so, so incredibly rich. I think one of the clearest signs that this is an authentic message from God is how deeply you can go just sort of level after level. In many ways, it reminds me of the sacred scriptures, which shouldn't surprise anyone because a divine revelation from God is going to be that way. But with the scriptures, it's, you know, you can read it and there's an interpretation and there's more interpretation beyond that. And then you find a detail and that's got a whole sort of you know, universe inside this detail. And, and so there's always a richness. It's ever new. And of course, also always ancient and traditional, the sacred scriptures, uh, and always nourishing us. And when you start looking, I think, more closely at the message of Fatima, you realize that also, the more you dig in. Unfortunately, many times we don't. You know, people are very, are familiar sort of maybe with just the, the cursory major points some people might just say, well, I know Our Lady appeared and asked us to pray the rosary and said something about peace. And they sort of leave it at that. And yet, obviously, her words are much more. And then some people know more about the words. But then you've gone and done something which I'm very grateful for because you've sort of started plumbing many of the details that even people who I think know the message of Fatima quite well, you know, the words of Our Lady, what she's asking of us, uh, the, difficult, the errors of Russia, things of that sort, that even many of those people don't know or don't pay sufficient attention to. Um, so that's really what we want to do, I think, in this show, is, is delve into those. And so the first question might just be, why do you think it is important to delve into those, and why did you dedicate a book to, to just that? What, what's the reason for it? Why did I think it was important? It was basically what you just um, what you just said. Not enough people knew about all of the different signs at Fatima. Some did know about the miracle of the sun. Um, some would see artistic, you know, the renditions of statues or holy cars of Our Lady of Fatima. 
showing the tree or the cloud over it. And they didn't realize that was one of the signs seen by the people there. Um, there's even one out there that shows um, the Blessed Mother standing on the tree with the with the cloud and the children kneeling in front of her. And the scar sky behind her is a bit dark and you can see stars. That actually happened. The sky got a little bit darker as if in an eclipse and stars were seen at high noon, although it didn't get as dark as an eclipse. And those were just one of the many signs witnessed by the people which kept increasing or repeating themselves up until October the 13th, 1917, uh, when, of course, the promised sign was given, the miracle of the sun. Um, as for the work, it, it was a compilation of many years of reading and studying. Um, you know, I had been interested in Fatima since a child. I was a member of the original Blue Army with the original message as it used to be. And so I've always believed that, you know, all of these things had to be done. And I knew, I learned about St. Michael the most by, by learning about Fatima. Um, but we did not know for sure, I mean, it's never been declared by the church that we believe with what they call moral certainty that St. Michael is the, um, the archangel that appeared to the children the year before Our Lady in 1960, in 1916, three times, three different appearances. Um, but I, I started off the book with that because that's how the apparitions began with, with St. Michael, the archangel, who's also the guardian angel of Portugal. And the whole book is about, the whole part of the front part of the book is about that. And then it goes into the signs month by month, what the children saw, what the people saw. Um, and then different things about devotion to Our Lady, the teachings of the Church on Our Lady, and her role in you know the Office of Salvation, um, and of course Our Lord Him, Our Lord Himself, because that's what the whole message of Fatima is. As always, Our Lady says, you know, my Immaculate Heart will be the path that leads you to God, and that is why I wrote it because Fatima to me is the most important Marian apparition. In my book, I call it the crown of all uh, Marian apparitions, and this is why. I've got bookmarks in there, but uh, this is why this book was published, and it's about 362 pages with over 1,000 footnotes, which I relied on divine revelation, you know, uh, tradition and scripture, quoting many of the, the Bible verses, quoting many of our saints, including St. Alphonsus de Liguri, St. Louis de Montfort, um, Thomistic scholars like Father Gergo de Ronge. So this is not something that I just made up or, you know, pulled out of thin air or out of my imagination. This is the years of many years of research. I mean, you should yeah. say the result. Many years of research. Now, it's certainly very, very well documented. And then uh, also, just before we go on, a quick message to our viewers. Uh, we want to thank Mariana for joining us. She actually lives out uh, kind of, you might say, in the middle of nowhere in far off country. <laughs> so if you see yes. any difficulties in the video or the audio, uh, please do bear with us. Please have patience. Uh, we're grateful that she's out there. Actually, I think her internet connection has gotten boosted uh, just recently. But there yes, might still be, yeah, there might still be some delays. And uh, we, we know that some of those people will comment on that. We want you to know that we're, we're aware of it and we are addressing it as best we can. So thank you and please, uh, you can bear with us patiently as that is one of the spiritual works of mercy. Um, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I do think it's certainly very well researched. Uh, the work is thank well you. researched and I am one who very much appreciates that and is grateful to you for that. And then also, again, those details just really highlight divine providence. The, the more yes. we can sort of plumb those depths and the details, the more we see the hand of God at work in, again, even the smallest details, which means, you know, you can apply that very quickly to yourself and say, even in the small vicissitudes of my own life that I'm going day to day, God is at work there and divine providence, the grace is covering that as well. So I think it should really serve to strengthen our faith and our hope, uh, which would naturally also, God willing, strengthen our charity. So that's the reason for the, the book. Thank you. And we, again, we'll hope you can get it. We'll put the information certainly for the book in the show more notes beneath for anyone who'd like to order it and sort of read along. And just to give you a little insight into how we'll do this, what we'll start this time, we will take just one small passage and try to analyze it and digest it for you. So it's a passage I've picked and we'll ask Mariana, we'll ask you to comment on it. This is, I believe, coming from the apparition in June. So this would be June 13th, the second apparition. And I'm taking it from, in your book, it's pages 20 through 21 of the text. So here's what you wrote. Um, and you were, I believe, quoting, it was um, 
I am forgetting her name right now. It's the lady. I think it was Maria Carrera. De Carrera. Maria de Carrera, exactly, who was one of the first and most devoted ones who always came. Right. She comes the second time and is there. She built up the little structure there by the tree. Okay. So she writes, this is her testimony, that on June 13th, uh, she saw nothing but a slight cloud just a few inches away from the foliage. Here she's referring to the holm oak tree that Our Lady came upon. Uh, so this slight cloud rising slowly towards the east. Some of the 50 onlookers then discerned an unintelligible murmur, like the sounds of a very faint voice, uh, but we could not understand what it was saying. It was almost like the buzzing of a bee. And here you're also referencing uh, Frere Michel's work, so that's the footnotes even taking us to the whole truth about Fatima, which I believe many of our readers are familiar with his name, and his work is one of the sort of the major definitive works on Fatima. So, again, that's just a small passage, but we've got some details, and I like to flesh them out a little bit. Uh, for example, why might Our Lady have chosen a slight cloud? Why did uh, Maria de Carrera get to witness that? I think that goes back, well, I'm pretty sure that it goes back um, to the Old Testament um, in Exodus and Numbers and other passages um, in, in the Holy Scriptures in which God himself manifests himself in a cloud or a pillar of cloud. Um, we also have, um, well, I would say commentary from saints, again, including uh, St. Alphonsus uh, de Liguri. Um, and we know that, for example, with this particular sign, which was a constant from June until October, um, May was the first apparition, and, and um, of course, only the children were present. By June, it had, you know, some of the news about this had spread throughout the village, so it's estimated just about 50 people were left. And of course, word spread through all those months, so that by October, we had 70 to 100,000 people present at Fatima. Um, but our Lord was giving different signs, like this cloud, this constant, and um, as I explained, in my book, there, there's a true sign from, from the Lord, as we learn from the scriptures, has at least one of seven functions. Um, it can confirm God's word, his goodness, it authenticates the prophecy given, it verifies God's blessings um, and his intervention, and in this case, the intervention of our, of our Lord through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Uh, it strengthens the faithful with hope, and it shurns, ensures or testifies God's presence through the apparition whether it was, you know, on Mount Tabor to, to Fatima. Um, and it, it can also declare his judgment upon sin. And as far as what we know from the Fatima apparitions and the message itself, it does appear that uh, Fatima fulfills all seven of those purposes. So we consider that what they call a Mariophany, um, with all of these signs that we, graph, we, we get. And in brief, Mariophany may be defined as appearances of Mary to, to mankind, uh, just that so we have Theophany with appearances of our Lord in the Old Testament, the appearance of um, our Lord after his resurrection. Uh, so when we have this cloud that we have seen uh, in, in Holy Scripture, we know that the people who were there, the faithful at least, immediately conclude concluded that this cloud revealed the presence of the Virgin Mary. Now, we know she isn't God, of course, but God was also manifesting his presence that he had sent her to earth to give us this message. And we, again, can look anywhere from Exodus to, um, let's see, um, Numbers again, and uh, Kings. So, for example, in uh, Deuteronomy, we hear, and the Lord appeared there in the pillar of a cloud, which stood in the entry of the tabernacle. Um, and it's interesting because later Lucia, who became a nun, would speak of um, Our Lady and calling her, you know, the infused with the presence of the Holy Trinity, which of course is true, because if you are in the state of sanctified grace, you are filled with the presence of God. You know, our Lord did tell us we have to eat his body and drink his blood, or you will not have life with you. Uh, so of this mysterious column of cloud, um, which at times was just a light little wisp, other times it did pour down from the home oak tree, especially in July when the third secret was given. And again in September, when even more people came, um, the pillar of cloud like uh, St. Ambrose wrote, that pillar of cloud did, in its outward appearance, go before the children of Israel. But as a mystery, it signified the Lord Jesus, who was to come in a light cloud. As Isaiah said, that in the Virgin Mary, who was a cloud on account of the inheritance of Eve, but light because of her virginal integrity. Um, 
we have St. Alphonsus, who speaks of the Old Testament's pillar of cloud and the pillar of smoke. And he said, this stupendous pillar, at times as a cloud, at others as fire, and he's quoting Richard of St. Lawrence, was a figure of Mary fulfilling the double office that she constantly exercises for our good. As a cloud, she constantly protects us from the ardor of divine justice, and as fire, she protects us from devils. And then, of course, we have St. Alphonsus, who refers to this pillar of cloud in the Canticles and refers about it, you know, to, to Our Lady, again, as another figure type. St. Louis de Montfort said that Mary is the sanctuary and the repose of the Holy Trinity, which, of course, is echoing the Church's teaching on her. And he finally also said, Mary is a holy place and the holy of holies, where saints are formed and molded. And so when we think about what this cloud did, the different manifestations it made, either pouring out over the humble tree or going up the uh, three times like incense during the Mass, during benediction, uh, St. Alphon- Saint, I'm sorry, with uh, Saint, um, not Saint, Michael, Michael of the Holy Trinity, said that, um, that this cloud uh, appeared to be liturgical incense to remind us that Our Lady is the abode of the Holy Trinity and the Ark of the Covenant, where again we see the, the cloud of the Lord resting on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. All of these were figure types for Our Lady, or of course other figure types for Our Lord in the Old Testament. And so Our Lord is showing us that He doesn't change. He's immutable. These signs are the same ones we will see in the Old Testament. Well, that, that's very, very powerful. Uh, again, I'm just going to summarize very quickly for our listeners. If you didn't catch all that, obviously you can go back and listen. But what we're saying here is that this cloud truly is manifesting God's presence and the intimate the intimate relationship between our Blessed Mother and the Holy Trinity. So you know it's God being present there, but it's the Blessed Mother and His relationship. It harkens us back to Eve, her immaculate conception. Uh, it shows how our Blessed Mother protects us. Also how she leads us, for that's what the glory cloud, the Shekinah did in the Old Testament for the people in Exodus. It links us to the holy sacrifice of the Mass because of its connotation of incense and therefore of the worship of God and of Christ's ultimate sacrifice, the sacrifice of her son, as well as powerful Old Testament typology, the Ark of the Covenant, the Tabernacle. It's almost like you can take the whole of the Old Testament, um, and our Blessed Mother is on every page of the Old Testament, the fathers will say, and, and you're seeing that that here at the apparition of Fatima. So, so definitely very powerful. W- what about that? Could you comment also just for a moment on the Shekinah? I use that term. I'm not familiar if everyone knows the term Shekinah, that glory cloud. Of, the Shekinah, yeah, the Shekinah. Um, yes, the, well, again, I think that takes us back to, um, especially we will see it with Moses, um, the most magnificent um, of the well, and probably the most well known of the prophets, at least in, in that particular sense, the Shekinah. The Shekinah was the God was God's presence. That's what the Jewish people called it, and it literally means the dwelling or the settling of God, whether in a person or in an object. So again, like the Ark of the Covenant or Solomon's Temple, this cloud was seen indicating the presence of God, and. Furthermore, that word, the Hebrew word Shekinah, was interchangeable with the word that they used for God. So it's not to show us that Our Lady is God. Of course not. There are some people who are being kind of ridiculous when they make that accusation, but the Catholics believe that Mary is God. No, but we understand if you are in the state of grace, as our Lord told us, and I've already said, you have the presence of God within you, right? The kingdom of God is within you. So, of course, Our Lady, who is raised from the dead, um, or if, as the, Jew, um, the people believe, the Dormition, which I kind of favor myself, but when Our Lady was assumed body and soul into heaven, of course, since she's in heaven, she would have the dwelling of the Holy Trinity within her anyway, but she is also the mother of God and the queen of all saints, queen of earth, queen of our, queen of our kingdom, queen of the Catholic city. No, that's wonderful. And um, I, again, just with, uh, with regards to that Shekinah and that glory cloud, I'm not sure if anyone's ever had the privilege. It doesn't happen too often these days to get to see the dedication of a church, especially really according to the traditional rite of the Catholic Church. Uh, I was uh, graced with the opportunity to see that once. I hope to see it again. But I really was struck because at one moment when the bishop is consecrating the altar, they, in effect, set it on fire. I mean, there's, there's fire at the four ends of the altar that will be used for the holy sacrifice. 
And that's very evocative of the Old Testament. And there's so much incense that there really is a kind of glory cloud going up. And, and there's all this smoke and incense in the church. You, you are taken back to, since you just mentioned the temple, the temple being dedicated to God, and you see that glory cloud, and that obviously highlights the deep connection that Mary has with the church, right? Mary is our mother, our spiritual mother. Holy Mother Church is our mother. We're born in the baptismal font of the church, but we're also spiritual children of Our Lady. She is the, the prototype, the ideal model of even the church. So there's, there's these connections as well with the cloud. And, and lastly, I think my favorite one, which I always think of when I think of the cloud, uh, and perhaps it's the brown scap of the devotion. You know, we immediately think of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and we go back to, I believe it's Kings, uh, Three Kings, Third Book of Kings, Chapter 18. Uh, that's the famous battle that Elias has with all of the priests of Baal. And when the fire comes down again and consumes the sacrifice, and then, of course, Jezebel gets very angry and she's going to chase him, so he has to flee. But there's been that drought for three years, and he sends his servant down to the bottom of Mount Carmel. The servant can't see anything until finally he sees a little cloud in the shape of a foot that is forming over the Mediterranean and is going to be coming over the Holy Land, which is going to bring rain. And that's, of course, what's going to bring, we could say, life and salvation to the people under a drought. We've always seen a picture or a type, a type of the Blessed Mother in that cloud as well. So can we make that connection too? Yes, it's in my book. I do, I do talk about Elijah and Mount Carmel um, and um, the in, in regard to some other signs too. Yes, so I have that uh, definitely in in the book. And um, the other thing, um, which I know you were going to probably ask it anyway about, why the East? Um, one thing that many people don't know in addition to the cloud, how could they if they don't know about what the, the cloud was real, is that this cloud was sometimes seen to um, come from the East stay and hover over the um, home oak tree, which, the, which was the site of the apparition of Our Lady herself, and then later gently lift and go toward the east. There was also a globe that would first appear in September and again in October, which again was seen just like the cloud to come from the east, come down to the home oak tree, disappear, that one disappeared, but the cloud did not, and then appear and go again to the east. So when we look again to the Holy Scriptures, we will see that the east is always tied in with our Lord. And we again see it starting with the Old Testament, um, for example, in Numbers, uh, quote, before the tabernacle of the covenant, that is to say on the east side, shall Moses and Aaron camp with their sons, having the custody of the sanctuary in the midst of the children of Israel. So, of course, uh, I think it was St. Justin the Martyr, which I did mention in my book, that said, you know, since the coming of Christ, we of the, of the church are the Israelites. We are the new Israel. We are the children of Israel. Now, in the Old Testament, we know that God's instruct, instructed Moses to uh, have the tabernacle in the wilderness face toward the east. He said it had to always face toward the east. And as I said in my book, it was toward the Mount of Olives, where in the future, uh, Mount, you know, Mount Olive would be the, the beginning, the sign of our, our Lord's passion. Um, and would there begin. And a, it's a figure type too for the Virgin Mary, because the Old Testament tabernacle is also a figure of the eternal church, which Christ founded, um, you know, upon the rock, Peter. We also see that um, in Ezekiel, for example, he, he says, uh, quote, And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the east gate of the house of the Lord, which looketh toward the rising of the sun. And, of course, the sun is a material symbol for the Son of Justice, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so that is how the uh, prophecy of Ezekiel opens, which the Dewey Rames Bible prefaces in this manner, saying it is a prophecy against the presumptuous assurance of the great ones. A remnant shall be saved and receive a new spirit and a new heart. Uh, then we, of course, again in Ezekiel, we hear it again about the glory of the Lord went up to the middle of the city. We could look at that too now, even as the Catholic city, meaning the church, the kingdom of God on earth. And it stood over the mount that is on the east side of the city. I mean, you could find many references to uh, the east, the east over and over again. 
Um, so we know, too, that tradition teaches us, and again, I mentioned that in my book, The Fatima Book, that the eastern gate of the ancient temple of Israel is a figure type of Our Lady, who, as the Immaculate Conception, is the glory of God. And as St. Louis de Montfort uh, wrote, the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of the fathers, also styles the Blessed Virgin the eastern gate, by which the high priest, Jesus Christ, enters the world and leaves it. Uh, by it, he came the first time, and by it, he will leave it the second time. Uh, the sanctuary, um, I shouldn't have said leave it, arrive the second time through some way we cannot foresee exactly, but through the Blessed Mother again, which I believe has to do with the promised era of peace at Fatima. Um, the sanctuary of the divinity, the repose of the most holy trinity, the throne of God, the city of God, the altar of God, the temple of God, the world of God even. These are all different epithets that have been used and in which he said are substantially true with the references which the Most High has wrought in Mary. So there is so many different things we could uh, add, but the final thing I would add, and which is how I closed one of the chapters, it had to do with um, a quote about our Lord, which we again see, I think it's in Zechariah, let me see. Um, no, I'm sorry, Matthew. And uh, for as lightning cometh out of the east and appeareth even in the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That's from Matthew 24, verse 7. And in that quote, our Lord is foretelling his second coming and the last judgment of the world. And St. John, John Damascene commented on this, saying, At his ascent into heaven, he went into the east, and so do the apostles pray to him. He will come again as the apostles saw him going, and as the Lord himself says, for as lightning comes from the east. And I find that interesting because lightning was also seen at Fatima. Um, and so again, the east is always a symbol, uh, symbolic of Christ. It's a symbol of Christ. It's the reason why God wanted the tabernacle of, of Moses' time to face the east, why the star of Bethlehem was seen to rise in the east, why Catholic altars traditionally face the east, and why in this modern age, Our Lady of Fatima, who we hail in the litany of Loretto as Gate of Heaven, arrived and departed to the east. That's beautiful. No, yes, and uh, as you were mentioning on all of it, I immediately thought, I mean, yes, our Lord begins his passion there, and I think you reference it, that's where he ascends, and that's where tradition tells us he will come again, as you just quoted from Matthew 24, 7. So that's sort of the site of the general judgment and of the second coming, which we all uh, await, of course, that our Lord will return. So just with those two very small details of the cloud rising into the east, and again, I'm not sure if all uh, the devotees of Our Lady of Fatima, the devotees, they realize these details. Uh, one thing that I certainly, for example, didn't realize, I just want to highlight it, you said it earlier and it's in your book, but that idea of the cloud rising three times and that people would see it and it looked like incense. Uh, I did know about the cloud, yes. but didn't know that detail. So there's a lot for us to learn here. Uh, hopefully you, dear listener, viewer, have been enriched by just some of the richness we see connecting it to the scriptures and the fathers and the whole, the whole Catholic faith. As I said, just these two details, cloud slowly rising to the east. Marianne, I'd like to thank you very much for sharing all that with you, with us. And uh, we'll, we'll keep diving right into some of these signs and secrets of Fatima in our next episode. Dear viewer, I hope you can tune in and we'll, we'll see you then. Let's go ahead and just close with the glory be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, Father and to the Son, to the Son and, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Mariana. May God bless you. May God bless you, dear reader. We'll see you again here soon in a couple weeks. Thank you, David. Thank you.